Well, I'm here today to advocate on behalf of Micro ATX. Asus Prime Z690M Plus D4, that's DDR4. This is a Micro ATX motherboard for Alder Lake or LGA 1700. And uh, it's a fun board. It's got some quirks. It's got some stuff we need to talk about. But also, it's kind of a eulogy for Micro ATX, maybe a little bit. I don't know. I see a trend with Micro ATX. Let's let's chat. <laughs> recommend this board if you're going to do an i5 or an i7 build and you want something more compact and you want a z690 motherboard that's going to cost less than $200. For less than $200 this motherboard is a pretty good deal but you're giving up kind of a lot of stuff. So let's run through the board layout. All right first up the most impressive component of this board is that the uh, the VRM heatsink especially in the rear it has this huge spoiler on the back. There's a couple things I need to show you with the FLIR. So there's a lot of thermal mass there. This huge spoiler to carry heat away from the VRM. First at the top edge, we've got our eight pin plus four pin CPU power connector. The VRM on this motherboard can actually manage an i9, assuming that you've got a lot of airflow around the VRM area. But longer term, I don't know that I would recommend that. The i7 or the i5 is probably better. The i7's, you know, four less efficiency cores. You're gonna save some power there. And the, the i5 is far less power. Not a board I'd recommend for overclocking. You could run the i9 on this. Just make sure you've got appropriate cooling and keep an eye on the uh, temperature of the back of your motherboard because it, it may surprise you. We've got three four pin fan headers along the top, one for a dedicated water pump. We've got a 50-50 E12 volt RGB header as well as a digital RGB header, standard 24 pin power connector, four pin fan header, and then we've got our USB front panel connections. That's a 10 gigabit USB type C, as well as two USB five gigabit that are exposed in that 30 pin header. At the front edge, we've also got two six gigabit per second SATA ports flanked by another two along the bottom edge of the motherboard. So depending on if you're going for a compact case build, like the one we did in our archive server, where it had the right angle uh, connectors at the front, it was a little problematic. You get the two at the bottom edge of the board and in a system like that would have been no problem. We've also got a Thunderbolt header, which is designed for a four lane Thunderbolt at four add-in card that would go in the very bottom PCIe slot. And then we've got two USB 2.0 headers, two more LED headers, one digital, one 50-50, another four pin fan header, an RS-232 serial port header, and our front panel audio connection. In terms of M.2 connections on this motherboard, it has three plus one. Three for M.2 memory and PCI Express devices, one that's an E key for a wireless device, which would actually be under one of your existing M.2. It's a pretty genius layout as far as that goes. This motherboard will only support up to 80 millimeter M.2. You cannot run a 110 millimeter M.2 if you're gonna rock, you know, enterprise storage or something like that. It also does not come with any M.2 heat sinks or cooling whatsoever, literally nothing. So that could be good or bad, depending on what, what M.2 that you're gonna buy. The PCIe layout here is the M.2 right below the CPU socket is connected to the dedicated NVMe lanes on the CPU. And then the other two below the PCI Express 5 slot are connected to the chipset. Now the Z690 chipset, if you're not clued in, is Intel's best chipset ever. And I literally mean that because that's something that I usually complain about. If you look at my old motherboard reviews, it's like, what if you're an enthusiast and you want to run more than a couple of devices? Z690 has eight PCI Express 4.0 lanes worth of bandwidth from the chipset to the CPU. That's a lot of PCI Express 4 bandwidth. That's 16 gigabytes per second, unidirectional. You can actually, you know, it's a duplex. The Z690 chipset also provides additional PCI Express 3 and 4 lanes, but it's not gonna bottleneck from the chipset to the CPU as it would have in prior generations. This is really awesome. In addition to the massively widened and upgraded chipset connection, we've also got that dedicated NVMe lane. So that's actually technically something that was added a couple of generations ago, the dedicated NVMe lanes, but PCI Express 4.0 there, that's pretty good. And then to the GPU, we've got 16 lanes of PCI Express 5. Yeah, not four, but PCI Express 5. So LGA 1700 has ample PCIe connectivity, and you can completely max out every PCIe and M.2 peripheral in the system, and you will not bottleneck. That's nice. If we turn our attention to the rear I.O., uh, it's maybe a little disappointing, but I mean, again, this is a sub $200 Z690 board. A significant portion of that $200 cost is going to Intel for the chipset. Intel might have aggressive pricing on their CPUs this generation, but I guarantee you the pricing on the chipset, not as aggressive. Motherboard manufacturers have to deal with that. 
Who knew? At the rear I.O. we've got two USB 2 ports, HDMI and DisplayPort. That's for the integrated GPU if you get an Intel CPU that has a built-in GPU. Then we've got a 20 gigabit USB Type-C, 10 gigabit USB Type-A, and then four or five gigabit USB Type-A. The integrated NIC, that is a one gig Intel NIC. I'll complain about that in a minute. And then of course, we've got our audio solution. This is a 7.1 audio solution, but it's based around the Realtek 897. I would have liked to have seen the Realtek 1220, but again, sub $200, you can't have everything. If I were gonna change one thing about this motherboard, it would be the NIC. One gig, should be at least 2.5 gig. The Intel 225V, when you pay those exorbitant chipset fees, they basically give you the 225V, come on. Should have been the Intel 225V. But hey, one gigabit, I guess that's fine. I've got the PCI Express by four slot at the bottom. I could run a 10 gig, you know, an Intel X550 in that and still fit a triple slot GPU. So real world, I don't think that'll be much of a problem. All right, <laughs> fireside chat slash ramble time. I really like Micro ATX as a small form factor alternative to ITX that still gives you a ton of flexibility and expansion options. Z690 is a nice enough chipset that you could run M.2 RAID and have a, a huge beefy triple slot GPU and a whole bunch of other options. If you are gonna run a triple slot GPU, it doesn't make sense to me that there's not motherboard underneath that to have more peripherals. It's not like it's really gonna take up that much more room unless you're running an ITX case that uses a ribbon or a right angle connector or something like that to physically place the GPU somewhere else. So this is not a huge motherboard. Theoretically, not a huge motherboard would be easier to manufacture because it's not physically as big. There's, there's not as much stuff to worry about. There's maybe not quite as many PCIe slots. This is a good option because most people are not gonna run multiple really high speed peripherals. And ITX often a lot of engineering time is spent shrinking everything to fit in an ITX footprint. If it weren't for uh, the economies of scale, Micro ATX would probably actually be cheaper than ATX. And in fact, Micro ATX is cheaper when you look at OEM systems. This is why Dell and HP and other companies like that don't ship boards in their desktop systems that are larger than Micro ATX generally. And uh, certainly some of them are even smaller than Micro ATX, but a lot of them don't really approach the size of mini ITX until you start getting into, well, we need a really small form factor business system and we're willing to pay a little bit extra for it. This is the sweet spot in terms of manufacturability, assuming that the scales were comparable between ATX and micro ATX. Now here's where the, the, the fly in the ointment is. Micro ATX, for whatever reason, deeply unpopular. And so it, we're in this kind of cycle, it seems like, where the micro ATX motherboards get a little bit lower end with every cycle, a little bit closer to those OEM boards that maybe would have trouble overclocking when we're talking about K-series Intel Alder Lake CPUs. They can still be a good alternative um, for a small-ish form factor build, but there are more gotchas. Lower end audio, lower end NIC. Yeah, you can solve some of that with add-in cards, but then they've sort of defeated the purpose. So don't really like that. But for a compute machine, eh, it can work. I'm actually planning to put this in an i7 build based around the uh, Lee & Lee Landcool 205M. And you know, again, if you look at micro ATX motherboards and the cases that go really well with them, like the Landcool 205M, no USB-C. There's no USB-C front panel. You can get a USB-C option uh, and you can always run USB-C out the back panel or through somewhere else in the case, but no USB-C. Another feature of this motherboard is that it has multiple holes for your uh, CPU cooler mounting solution. This is to make the motherboard physically compatible with prior generation CPU coolers. And therein is another problem. If you're gonna run a K-series CPU, you'd better have the correct mounting pressure for your CPU or your CPU is going to thermal throttle, overheat. It's not gonna be a great experience. So while you can physically use an older generation cooler, unless you're extremely careful, it's not going to have appropriate physical contact, <laughs> appropriate physical contact with the CPU to cool it properly. So I recommend only uh, solutions from your cooling solution manufacturer that are LGA 1700 certified. And so far I'm having better luck with all-in-one coolers than I am with tower coolers, but I think once I've got some more tower coolers that have proper mounting kits for Alder Lake, I'll, it'll probably be okay, especially when we're talking about the i5 and maybe also the i7. But I got this board for an i7 build, so stay tuned for that. 
on the level one text channel. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, in terms of BIOS support and other features and things like that, because it is DDR4, the motherboard does actually advertise support for DDR4 speeds up to 5300, 5333 to be exact. And the fastest memory that I have is DDR4 4000. That's a crucial ballistics kit. And that did work in this motherboard without too much issues. So yay, XMP Optimum, that's really good. Thanks, Intel. If you do pick this up and you want to set up Intel RAID, the VMD devices, be sure to check out our separate video on RAID with the Z690 chipset specifically. It works without any VROC or key specialties or licensing or any kind of shenanigans that would make it difficult to use. And on a platform like this, you could run, you know, a RAID 0 or a RAID 1 of M.2. Well, with three slots, you could run RAID 5, one off the CPU and then two off of the chipset. And it won't bottleneck because there's not a lot of other PCI Express connectivity in this platform, so. It's pretty cool stuff. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at the Asus Z690M Plus D4. If you wanna see the build video, check out our other videos, get subscribed, leave a comment, let me know what I got wrong. The forum, forum.level1text.com. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.